Hi, my presentation today is on the use of RPAS in the quarry environment. Or how I get to play with cool toys while pretending to be working. My name is Rodney Pilbrow. I have been involved in mining and construction for nearly 30 years since attaining a Bachelor of Engineering in Mining from Auckland University. I have been operating RPAS for construction surveys since 2011. First thing I should do is explain what RPAS is. It stands for Remotely Piloted Aerial System and is the term that the Civil Aviation Authority uses to talk about what most people know as unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned aircraft systems or more commonly drones. What I want to talk about today is how I use our RPAS systems for surveying within quarries. Firstly, I will give a brief rundown on surveying methods, then explain why I chose to go with a remotely piloted aerial system. I will describe how we get 3D data from 2D images, followed by an overview of RPAS capabilities and limitations and what accuracies can be achieved. I'm also going to make you aware of what the current legal restrictions are to using these systems. Lastly, I will show you some examples of what we do with the resulting data. There are basically two ways of capturing data for a topographic survey of a site. The standard way of doing a topographic survey is to use either a GPS or total station to capture data. The coordinates and levels of relevant points are recorded and some sort of code attached to them. Then a terrain model is built up from these individual points. LiDAR can be used in aerial and ground-based surveys. LiDAR for aerial surveys can cover large areas of ground and has some ability to capture ground under vegetation. Ground-based LiDAR scanners capture point clouds of millions of points to millimetre accuracy. Photogrammetry has been the traditional method of obtaining data from aerial surveys and again they can cover large areas of ground but they do need clear skies. Both LiDAR and photogrammetry gather vast numbers of uncoded points which are used to build up a terrain model. Our current RPAS systems are using photogrammetry to capture data. So why did I choose to purchase an RPAS system? In 2010, the global financial crisis had reduced our traditional construction work, while at the same time our quarry clients were becoming increasingly concerned with safety and I could see the time coming when we would not be able to work on some sites with our existing equipment. I began to look at new technology to see if there was something that could help us weather the downturn, attain a significantly higher level of safety and provide a replacement income stream. I wanted something that would be just another box in the van, another tool like the GPS or total station, something that would give us another option when deciding what the best way of surveying a site was. After some investigation, I decided that an RPS unit was the way to go as it could supplement the services we provided by making the capture of larger areas more economic for our clients. It could eliminate many of the hazards of working in a quarry by reducing the time required on site and capturing data from areas that were too dangerous to access. And the images from flights provide a stunning enhancement to how we present data as well as being of use for other purposes. I am now going to cover the thing which I get the most questions on. How do you get 3D data from 2D images? If you have two photos of the same object taken from different positions, then it is possible to calculate the three-dimensional coordinate of any point which is represented in both photos. This is the principle of stereoscopic viewing and is how we see. The main task of photogrammetry is to calculate the intersection of lines originating in an image through the camera center to the point of interest. The position of a point in space is defined by three coordinates, but there are only two coordinates available to define its position in an image. To find the 3D location of a point from 2D images, the internal geometry of the camera and the location of the camera in space are needed. Then the location of the object point can be calculated from the intersection of rays from different images. A real camera will differ from an ideal model 
by using a relatively complex lens, a camera housing which is not built for stability, and an image recording surface which may be neither planar nor perpendicular to the image ray. This camera geometry is determined by calibration. The camera location is described by the coordinates of the centre of projection of the camera and three angles expressing its rotation. The location parameters are calculated indirectly using well-identified points common to multiple images. Every such point has an image ray from the projection centre to the object point. If all the bundles of rays from multiple images are intersected, then a dense network is created. Using a method of triangulation known as a bundle block adjustment, any number of images can be simultaneously oriented. How it works practically is this. Images are loaded into the photogrammetry software along with the camera calibration and image GPS tags. The first stage of processing is to align the photographs to calculate a set of relative camera positions and an initial sparse point cloud. To enable referencing of the images to real world coordinates, ground control points are marked in each image that they appear. The data is then optimised by adjusting the initially estimated points, camera parameters and control point locations to minimise the errors. Once the camera positions and orientations have been found, the next step is building up the 3D data. The method, called semi-global matching, provides a high-speed way of generating point clouds on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. This means that image pairs with a 5 cm ground sample distance could be used to generate a cloud with a point spacing also of 5 cm. A mesh is formed from the point cloud to create a surface for further work. I would like now to discuss the capability and accuracy of UAV systems. The two systems which we have are capable of operating in wind speeds up to 40 km per hour. One of the reasons for choosing the systems we did was their ability to operate in such strong winds. New Zealand weather is so changeable that I needed to be sure that I could get the job done even if the weather changed. Unlike traditional aerial work, a UAS can be operated even on heavily overcast days as they operate below the cloud cover. Our first UAV was the Gatewing X100, a fixed wing which we bought back in September 2011. This is capable of covering a 100 hectare area in a single flight at its usual flying height of 100 metres. The X100 operation is completely autonomous. It is launched from a catapult, then follows the prepared flight plan and automatically lands. The X100 finishes a flight by landing on its belly. When working in quarries this has been a problem. Most of the damage which we have sustained has been due to poor landing surfaces. The flight planning software on the X100 is limited to mapping a rectangular area. To enable small sites and sites with difficult terrain to be flown, I bought a multi-rotor called the Altus Delta X8, which we took delivery of at the end of 2014. It is fitted with dual autopilot, dual GPS, four sets of twin rotors and a parachute system. The coverage per flight is less, only up to 10 hectares on one battery, but it is possible to program longer flights and do what is termed a hot swap during the flight. Being a multi-rotor, it takes off and lands vertically, so we can use it on sites which are impractical for the X100. The flight planning for the X8 allows for differing elevations, irregular areas and long thin routes. Having the two systems available means that I can choose the most appropriate one for a site. I now want to talk about how accurate data from a UAV can be. The two common outputs from our work are orthophotos and terrain models. Orthophotos are aerial photographs that have been geometrically corrected to remove distortion created by different elevations, lens effects and camera tilt. They are true to scale, so unlike an uncorrected aerial photo, they can have distances measured from them. The correction makes use of a terrain model, so how good this model is will affect how good the orthophoto is. The resolution of the final orthophoto and how well placed in the real world it is are what determines its accuracy. 
A terrain model is a digital representation of the ground shape and how well it matches the real world is the crucial factor. This will be a combination of how correct any individual point in a mesh may be and how dense the mesh is. The accuracy of a UAV dataset will depend on the camera used, the height at which the images were captured, the placement and accuracy of the ground control points and how dense the mesh is. The resolution of an individual image is measured by its ground sample distance. This is how much of the ground one pixel in the image represents. The ground sample distance which is achieved is related to the camera used and the height at which the image was taken. For a particular camera with a specific sensor size and focal length, the GSD is proportional to the flying height. So the higher the camera, the larger the ground sample distance. This is important because the resulting z-accuracy is about one and a half times the GSD. The cameras in our two systems have sensor and focal length combinations which give a ground sample distance of 3.3 centimeters at 100 meters above ground level. This means that one pixel in an image represents 3.3 centimeters of the ground and the expected z-accuracy of a point created from that pixel will be 5 centimeters. It must be pointed out that these are only relative accuracies. How well they fit to the real world will depend on how the data is georeferenced. For this we use ground control points. A minimum of three GCPs are required to position data in a 3D world. The absolute accuracy of a UAV mapping project can never be better than the ground control used to georeference the data. Optimally, the GCPs should be placed at the extents of the site and at any high and low points. I have found that this is especially true of abrupt elevation differences such as quarry faces. The final thing which will determine how well a particular data set matches the real world is the density of the resulting mesh. It is technically possible to form a mesh as dense as the ground sample distance of the images. However, to make the data easier to work with, the mesh is decimated, reducing the number of triangles to a specified level while maintaining the model shape. Denser data will give a more accurate representation but is slower to work with. If an accurate stockpile volume is required, then a 0.3 to 0.5 meter spacing might be used, while for a long-term development plan over a large area, a 5 to 10 meter spacing could be all that is needed. The nice thing about using data from a UAV survey is that if a denser model is required, then it can be extracted from the same image set. Whereas if you had done a ground survey, you would need to return to site and pick up more points. There are a number of restrictions in place regarding the operation of an unmanned aircraft system. The relevant law we operate under is part 101 of the Civil Aviation Rules. A recent law change means that from August 2015, any UAS operator must get consent to operate above any person or property if they wish to operate under Part 101. Other Part 101 restrictions are, you must maintain line of sight between the operator and the UAS at all times, you must fly in daylight only, you must give way to all other aircraft, you must not fly higher than 400 feet, you may fly no closer than 4 kilometers to an aerodrome, or within controlled airspace without permission. Controlled airspace is from ground level up in the control zones. To give you an idea of how extensive these areas are, the purple areas on this plan are the control zones for Auckland and Whanuapai airports. The grey areas are aerodromes which include hospitals when they have a heliport. Now I would like to show you some of the uses that we put our data to. Most of our UAS work is for volume calculations. This could be stockpile volumes, overburden stripping volumes, or figuring out how much rock is available from a newly opened face. The UAS enables us to do these surveys more safely, quickly, and accurately than before, and the results can be presented using the aerial images as a background. Having a good image of an area makes it easier for someone to see how a new piece of plant will fit within the existing operations. Similarly, it makes finding services easier if an as-built has a picture. The data can be used to assess bench and high wall safety 
or the extent of proposed stripping, while a high resolution image can be used to assess pre and post blast fragmentation or map geotechnical features of a high wall face. The ability to survey large areas and then present site plans with contours and imagery make for effective resource consent plans. Many people have trouble comprehending a map and the information it is trying to convey. So all of the site plans mentioned here can be more simply understood just by the addition of an up-to-date image. When dealing with non-technical people, the ability to present data as a 3D visualization gets around possible misunderstandings. Not everyone can comprehend contour plans and cross sections, whereas a fly around like this can give those affected a better understanding of what you are trying to achieve. Possible quarry layouts can be shown to neighbors in a way that they understand. Proposed bunding or planting can also be included in such a presentation so they can see what you are doing to reduce the effect your operation will have on them and hopefully prevent any objections. After four years of using RPAS in the quarrying environment, I have found that they enable me to react quickly to requests for information. It makes aerial surveys of smaller areas a viable option due to lower cost. I can capture denser data sets resulting in more precise calculations. And I can provide that information in a format that is easily able to be understood and accepted. All of this with reduced time on site without having to enter hazardous areas. And of course, I get to use leading edge survey technology. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, please email pillbrowsurveying at extra.co.nz.